Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Noor El Nibari. Welcome again to our show, Healthy Life. Tonight, um, the interviewer became the guest. Uh, we're interviewing Dr. Anud Lejuahil tonight. And if you have any questions for us throughout the show, just contact us throughout the numbers, and we will be right back. Welcome back, dear viewers. Tonight, as I said, we're going to interview Dr. Anud Lejuahel <laughs> because uh, she's actually going to leave the show. Okay. So thank you for coming to our show tonight, Dr. Anud. Thanks, Dr. Noor, for inviting me today to come and convincing me actually to come. Uh, it is really a pleasure. And it's quite actually weird to be uh, in the seat I know, I was just about to say, yeah. <laughs> how does it feel? sitting on that side. It is actually a quite hot chair, you know, all the palpitations starting right now. You don't right miss now. this chair. You don't yeah, miss, this is miss really being cold beside chair. me. Yeah, it is actually. I really <laughs> did miss that time. It's funny that because, you know, um, we're such good friends that we actually wore almost the same color. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because, I don't know, it's just I know. telepathic. It, I don't know. It's probably, as I say, they are my twin sisters, so probably we have the same thought and we have the exactly, same Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Anu, what is your future? What is my future? Is this quite actually mysterious future, <laughs> I would say. Everybody's future is mysterious, but do you have any it plans? It is, actually. Yeah, we have a lot of plans going on there. You know, um, I already finished my uh, family medicine board, and then now I joined the, the uh, trainer section and the, uh, also the examiner section. So probably I'm going to examine you one day, so be Ouch. prepared. <laughs> yeah, I'll be prepared, but you have to be nice. Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> With you, definitely. You have yeah. an extra credit for that. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm um, trying to think to have further steps on uh, later on with regard to the media and the TV wow, broadcasting. Wow, that's really good. I would love to. Uh, I got a lot of reviews from my uh, you know, viewers and my friends you know, that they would love to uh, hear me or see me in Arabic shows because they would like to get uh, the benefit of medical uh, news and medical topics uh, in their own native language. Absolutely, so, absolutely. I think so it's, it's, I a think good, it's a good thing because you're amazing. You are too. <laughs> so yeah. I think like uh, the Healthy Life shows is an amazing huge step that I made first of all and it's given me a lot of things. It gave me the confidence, you know, especially to be on live on TVs and it's given me you know, the way that w how we deal with the other guests and the interviews and so on. So yeah. uh, it is a huge step, uh, especially in the TV area or the media. Yeah. So uh, I wish if I can get a chance to, um, to broadcast any medical health, uh, you know, issues on TVs in Arabic language, that would be very beneficial to all our audience, I would say. I hope so. And I wish you all the luck in the world. That would um, be good. But my question is, what will you miss about this show? Well, <laughs> definitely, I, I will definitely, you, you, you are first. the number one then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would yeah. definitely miss the uh, company with you, definitely. Uh, it was really a pleasure to be with you, you know. It was, um, you know, you're really a great companion to be with, and we have a lot of laughter, you know, in the shows, and you know, a lot of a lot of things that 
been going on yes. behind the scenes. <laughs> behind the scenes, especially like if when you are on TV, alive, you know, on yeah. live and live shows, a lot of things could happen wrongly. And a lot of and crazy things could exactly. happen. Exactly, and it's happened. <laughs> a lot of things so happen. So tell us about the one crazy thing that well, happened and you, you really laugh about it really, really well, hard. Well, uh, I remember that we were interviewing one of our uh, consultants in gastroenterologist, gastro yeah. consultant, and we were in the stress that time and we would keep on going 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 and then i like i received a lot of messages from my family they were saying where are you where are you and <laughs> i remember I was like, that what's day. happening <laughs> and, and it was it, a bit yeah it was like it was a very windy day and yeah. i presume they lost the signals uh, with the broadcasting the uh, the shows so uh, apparently the show wasn't live that time so we were speaking on 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 and nothing and it was not live. <laughs> it, it, was, live. it was hilarious that yeah was I really remember funny. that day it was really funny but you have to be in control and you never expect you know what's going to yeah. happen you know you have to control yourself and try to relax your guests and so on so um now just can you just tell us who would you like to thank well, there is a lot of people that I would like to thank. First of all, I would like to thank the KDP2 uh, for, and all the members who is working in KDP2 who give me this chance actually to uh, uh, work in the Healthy Life shows. This is a really nice experience, especially for young Kuwaitis uh, graduates, you know. And I've got a lot of benefit from that. You know, I've got to know new doctors and a new pharmacist, a physiotherapist. You know, I mean, you made a lot of friends. It is. It is really a plus uh, with that, and I will never forget that. And also, uh, knowing you is, is actually a treasured thing. So and we will never forget you. I will Dr. never. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know we're good friends, and we'll keep in touch <laughs> after hopefully, the show. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, now we're just going to go on a short break, and Thank we will you. be right back. Thank you. Okay, now we're back in the show, and uh, with us is Dr. Anu Bidjwahel. Um, of course, I didn't express my feelings about you, really. Mm -hmm. You're more than just a friend. Thank you. You're amazing. Thank you. And I'm going to miss you. I will too. You, we shouldn't cry because <laughs> we do have makeup on, and we shouldn't cry. But um, I am, I'm, I'm blessed to be with you in the show, and I learned a lot from you. You're you. the most amazing and sweetest and beautiful person Thank from you. outside Thank and inside. You. And, and you uh, are. And you really, are really, really, uh, you have no idea how much I'm going to miss you oh, in this okay. show. It's like, seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you and, for all And uh, for that, I have to give you a gift. That and is this is from all the crew in the show. Oh and um, really, is this, this, this the only thing that we can do right now. But I mean, you deserve more than this. Um, I'm so thankful for this and I would like to thank the whole crew. I would like to express my thank to them and my love to them because they were really amazing. They were extremely uh, polite and enthusiastic and really encouraging. And I wish you all the best from the deepest of my heart and I wish you all the success uh, in life. And I wish uh, Noor, Dr. Noor that you have to bring now uh, this uh, program to a higher level, a higher standard in order to attract the highest numbers of audience and to convey our message to the audience. Absolutely, and uh, your message uh, and uh, the, what you said is actually an inspiration to all of us here. Thank and you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. I wish you all the luck and uh, blessings in your life and I hope to be with you 
soon in a, another show. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Let's think Why big. Not? Yes. And uh, and uh, that's it. Really. We will meet. Uh, we will meet we'll again. Meet Thanks again. again. Thanks like a, everyone. A beautiful song. <laughs> um, now, dear viewers, we have our first report, and it is uh, the conference uh, for combating uh, forgery and counterfeit in the medical uh, practice. And uh, stay tuned for this report. honor that uh, I represent His Highness uh, Sheikh uh, Sabah Al-Ahmed Jabal Sabah uh, uh, the patron of this important conference, uh, this conference that uh, uh, we hope uh, will uh, achieve um, firm steps in overcoming uh, the uh, forgery and uh, misuse uh, of trade names in medical uh, supplies. Uh, this is the first time this conference takes place in Kuwait uh, because of its importance. His Highness the Emir uh, decided to become uh, the patron, and uh, we hope that uh, this great number of uh, uh, important people uh, from both the private sector and public sector from uh, different Arab countries have the ability to uh, make forward strides uh, in this uh, issue. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Now we have our second report tonight, and it's the first Amiri Rheumatology and Rehabilitation Medicine Scientific uh, Day, and uh, we will see that right now, and we'll be back with our second guest. So stay tuned. Dr. Adiba Al Hirz, a consultant in internal medicine and rheumatology, Amiri Hospital. We're holding today the first Amiri Rheumatology Rehabilitation uh, Day, and uh, we're focusing on uh, back pain, uh, diagnosis, and uh, treatment. Uh, today's uh, conference is very unique. 
uh, in that uh, we're holding parallel sessions for both the public and for the doctors at the same time, and there is six points of CME for the doctors. Um, we're talking about the diagnosis of uh, back pain and the, difficult, and the different modalities to treat back pain in terms of the traditional ways like the uh, pharmacological treatment, I mean in terms of medicine, and uh, like the acupuncture, the uh, uh, chiropractor, the uh, injection medicine, the surgical aspect, the psychological aspect. So we're going to talk about the different aspects to cover uh, everything about the back pain. Of course, everything is updated, so we're going to update the audience about back pain. Uh, back pain is very important because 70% uh, uh, of the population uh, suffer from back pain at one point of their life, and 6% of them will have back pain uh, as a daily complaint. Now, among all the back pain, about 97% is due to uh, mechanical reasons, and that's uh, in terms of osteoarthritis, in terms of uh, disc prolapse, and in terms of uh, bad positions that we use uh, daily in our lifestyle. So accordingly, uh, we're giving uh, different advices to the population or to the doctors how to look after their back. Uh, in terms of prevention of back pain, so like uh, how to sit, how to sleep, um, how, to, how to eat, and how to do uh, daily exercise to look after their back. Dr. Aziz Al-Fili, I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist, consultant rehabilitation medicine, Namiri Hospital. Today we are hosting the first Amiri Rheumatology Rehabilitation Medicine Scientific Day, which is both for the physician and the public. For the physician, the program was from 9.30 till 6.30, which consists of dealing, teaching the doctors how to deal with low back pain, from diagnosis, treatment, investigation, etc. For the public, the program will be from uh, 3.30 to 6.30. It's unfortunately it's in Arabic because uh, uh, most of people speak Arabic. For the public, there will be from 3.30 to 6.30. It is to increase their awareness about the diagnosis as well as about the management. There are different ways of treating low back pain. So it will teach them about the traditional and non-traditional way. And also it will increase their awareness about the interventional uh, management, like injection in the back, as well about the surgery. So attending this will increase awareness for both uh, rheumat uh, physician as well as the public. Welcome back, dear viewers. And uh, now we have our second guest, and um, she is Dr. Dalal Al Aradi. She will be the next host of this show. So I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Dalal, to our show first of all, and congratulations on your um, on your graduation the last week. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am very glad to be here. Um, my name is Dr. Dalal Al Aradi. I am a general surgeon uh, from Amira Hospital, and uh, thank you for bringing up our graduation last <laughs> week. We, it yeah. was a blast, and uh, it was a really a lovely ceremony, and uh, um, it really was an amazing time for us. 
And um, how did it go? Tell us. It was beautifully organized by uh, KIMS, Kuwait Institute for Medical um, Specialization. Um, they've only recently started doing actually those graduation under um, the Secretary General, uh, Dr. Brahim Hadi. And I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is the second year that they've done it. And uh, it was at Raya. Uh, beautifully organized, uh, of course, under the patronage of uh, Sheikh uh, Mohammed Abdullah, our, uh, our Minister of uh, Health, and uh, we enjoyed it. It was lovely. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank I you. mean, uh, it must be a huge, huge, huge event in your life. It's like, basically, it's like as important as a wedding, like in the life of a doctor. I mean, just to finish from all of this, you know, studying and, you know, studying all the time. And I mean, this is a really, really huge step for you, isn't it? Um, it is. Um, I mean, as doctors, we've been through a lot of graduations. <laughs> as you we, know, we have been. School, exactly, from high <laughs> yeah. school and then college. And we've done a lot of studies. So this really is the... It, it's really the highlight for me it's the highlight of 2013 and it also was um, the best graduation that I ever had it really was that big of a deal for us and for me specifically that's amazing and uh, I would like to congratulate you again for you know uh, getting the degree and uh, you know this this big change in your life and I'm sure it feels amazing and the th second thing, um, I would like to welcome you in our show as the new host. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Anud has uh, a big shoes to fill, <laughs> but I mean, you're wearing the right shoes tonight. <laughs> I must you. say, your <laughs> shoes look amazing. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, they really are big shoes to fill in. It's, yeah. it's a pleasure meeting you, Dr. Noor, and yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's a shame that I didn't get to work with, uh, I don't get to work with uh, Dr. Anud. Um, it seems like a really a beautiful family, and I'm really uh, privileged to be part of the, uh, of the show and part of, of your family over here. And um, I really hope that um, I'm up to it. And I really hope that I can make some lovely changes, uh, add-ons to the, to the show. Yeah, of course, just being here is just, you know, a pleasure for me Thank just you. to meet you. Thank and you. you're such a lovely girl. And you're so much fun. <laughs> I think we'll have a lot of fun just, you know, That's uh, the plan. meeting a lot That's of doctors plan, really. and, uh, <laughs> you know, making new friends. And That's the um, really, um, you're such a lovely person. Thank you. Um, now, um, now, what do you think um, your future plans are? I'm, I'm sure like being a part uh, in the media is um, something that you're interested in. So where do you see your future in the media? Um, as doctors, I think that all of us look up to the doctor's show and, uh, and Dr. Oz also. So I know this is, um, I mean, it's a huge or it's a long journey away from it, but even achieving like 10% of what they have achieved and the awareness that they are, um, that they are bringing and, uh, and the influence that they're having on people, I mean, just to have that to me is, is totally self-fulfilling. So that's what I really hope. That's what I really hope to bring um, along with me um, to the Healthy Life Show. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> like I'm looking forward. For, as as you said, they're you know highly influential, and I think um, the media is extremely important just to send the right message to the people and spread the awareness uh, because um, you know not a lot of people know what to do, especially how to live a healthy life. And you know, as um, you know, problems uh, come up, like for example, obesity and cancer and these kind of things. Um, it's people need to know what to do next. But um, can you just tell us about your future as a doctor? Where do you see yourself? Um, after f graduating, after five years of study, I got to experience a lot of specialties. I got <coughs> to work with a lot of doctors, and uh, my personal. Um, favorite or specialty that I'm looking forward to is actually breast surgery. This is my plan, this is my future and um, I have a vision, <laughs> hopefully, that I'm going to fulfill, that I see myself actually fulfilling um, in, in my medical career. It's say. the most important thing to uh, envision yourself in your future because this is what gives you uh, a boost 
to just achieve your goals. And I think this is really amazing um, that you are doing this. Uh, breast surgery, of course, it's uh, an important part of the medical field as uh, we are seeing an increase in uh, the breast cancer, uh, breast problems in the community here in Kuwait. So can you tell me what is the commonest problem that you see in, in the breast? Um, we don't have any actual sp statistics to yeah. what we see, but um, in my OPD, um, what I see a lot, well, it differs uh, mostly through age, but the most uh, problem that I see people coming to me is they're having pain, nostalgia or breast pain. Okay. Um, a lot of people um, fear um, that there is something hidden or there is something underneath this, uh, this pain that they're experiencing. And usually this is mostly what um, a middle-aged or let's say a middle-aged person would come from, of course, uh, would come with. Um, younger people might come with fibroadenomas, which are totally benign. But the most problem, honestly, that I'm seeing on a daily ba basis, especially in the OPD, is breast pain. Okay. Um, do you believe in the saying, what's painful doesn't kill you? Um, I do. And, <laughs> and I'm talking only about the breasts. Um, I do, because a lot of the breast pain is, uh, that's the thing about it, there is nothing under, and uh, there is no underlying problem to the, to the breast pain itself. There is no mass, there is no tumor, and especially for the patients, there's no cancer. That's what they come worrying about. It's simply as it is, it's just pain, and you either have to live with it, or if it's so severe that you simply have to take medications just to relieve it. Okay, so if a patient, uh, I mean, or um, you know, some a, a viewer who's watching right now who is having currently breast pain, what do you advise her to do? Uh, first thing is to see a surgeon. Yeah, of course, um, she needs to be examined, mm -hmm. um, and um, we have in, in, in breast surgery um, we have a saying that that's like a triple, uh, the triple, uh, triple assessment. Yeah. We need history, we need examination, and we need imaging for those patients, definitely. Even if it was simple pain? Um, usually, uh, an ultrasound can suffice, okay. uh, especially if there is underlying cysts that could, be, um, that could be there. If there is any findings that we see during physical examination. If there wasn't, of course, then reassurance and given, uh, taking, of course, a total history from this patient, there isn't any family history, there isn't anything worrying or there isn't any black box warning, then we can simply reassure the patient and simply follow up regularly in the LPD. That's great. Now, um, we're seeing a lot of videos, especially with the American shows, that they encourage women to um, check their own breasts for any lumps. So what do you think about that? Should um, they or shouldn't they do it? Um, actually, according to the latest guidelines, that um, breast self-examination is not part of um, at the workup or we, sh we don't recommend it anymore for its, of course, for its reasons. Um, one, that a patient might actually miss a lump and so she might be under the false impression that there isn't anything and so she does not seek any medical attention. And second of all, that she might actually feel a lump which is totally benign and this yeah. might increase her anxiety about herself and that actually might cause extra or unnecessary anxiety or stress that patient so no breast um, self-examination is no longer recommended as uh, as screening for the ladies so um, what should um, they do like um, when should they have a breast exam um, usually, At what age do you recommend? Uh, usually the, uh, the recommendation for mammography over here in Kuwait that we start doing mammographies yearly at the age of 40 um, or if the patient has any any relative with, uh, especially first degree relative with the breast cancer, 10 years um, minus the age of that um, specific patient. Or, uh, of course, if the patient is having any complaint, then she's more than welcome to come. But yeah. mammography, usually at age 40. But what about examination? Like when should, for example, if she goes to her GP yeah. and she's asking for it, like, or she's asking when is the best time to do it. Is there a specific age do you recommend? Usually above 25 okay. for the for GP. However, as I said, um, the best is depending on the history, depending on the, um, yeah. on the patient, on, the, on the, her family and her risk factors of having any breast, of, any ha of having breast cancer in her family or her specific risk of getting breast uh, cancer herself. And now uh, the um, when should uh, a woman worry 
that um, she should get herself checked because there are women who are, you know, I have a lump, I just need to forget about it. Like, um, are there specific signs that you can see or you notice that you are considered red flags and you need just to go st immediately to a surgeon when you see them? Um, in general, any lump has to be investigated. This is, uh, this is a must. Any breast lump felt should be investigated. There are specific things in the lump itself. I mean, even a, a lump that we might feel completely benign can actually turn out to be malignant. So it has to be, um, that, that means um, further investigations has to be done. Um, another thing is um, having any kind of lump with a strong family history. If you have family members with breast cancer, speci specifically the mother or sisters, it has to be uh, investigated. Other things, if there is specific changes in the breast itself, uh, if there is uh, skin changes, if, there, if she's having nipple inversion, if she's having um, nipple discharge, spe specifically blood discharge, she has to seek medical attention or surgical attention as soon as possible. Yeah, and uh, you know, um, of course, uh, as you said, like it's, uh, it has to be done by a doctor, a professional doctor. Now we're going to go for a short break and we will be right back, so stay tuned. So I'm a registered dietitian from the Sman Diabetes Institute and today I'm going to be talking about hydration. So something we can all agree on is that it gets pretty hot in the Middle East, especially during the summer months. So people tend to lose a lot of water through sweat, breathing, uh, walking around, and all this water needs to be replenished. Our bodies consist of around 70% water um, and so most of our organs like our kidneys, our brain, our lungs rely on water to perform a lot of their activities. And so if a person is dehydrated or they don't have enough water, then a lot of the things that usually happen, the body can't happen because we don't have enough water. So a lot of people sometimes if they get thirsty, they rely on juices or sodas, um, but you don't want to do that because juices, even though they come with, a, with an amount of water that can keep you hydrated, they also come with a lot of sugar and a lot of calories and that can add to weight gain and you don't want to do that. Um, another thing that usually happens is that people usually mistake, hung mistake thirst for hunger. So they'll think they're hungry and start eating when they're actually just thirsty. So you always want to make sure you drink water all the time. Um, some people, so just plain old water, some people don't like water, they don't like the flavor, they like something that has a bit more flavor. So you can play around with it. You can add um, lemon wedges to your water, that gives a bit of flavor. You can add mint. Um, and if you keep the water with like lemon wedges or mint in the fridge for like, let's say, a few hours, then it'll get more of the flavor. Um, so that can work. If you don't like lemon, you like something a bit sweeter, a bit more fruity, then you can add um, just berries or strawberries and also just leave them in the fridge and you'll get a really nice flavor. Um, something else that you can do, you can create ice cubes that contain these um, fruits. So you just put the, just the, I, um, the cup of where you create all the ice cubes, um, put in the berries or whatever fruit of like tiny piece of fruit of choice, and then put in water, put it in the freezer, and you'll get like fruity ice cubes. Um, also, sometimes people tend to forget to drink water, they're moving around. Um, a lot of people who work at different sites, like engineers, don't have water around. Uh, so just make sure you carry a small water bottle with you. That's really important and uh, keeps you hydrated throughout the day. If you don't want to use plastic, some people prefer not to use plastic, um, then what you can do is just use uh, some of the metal containers or a glass container uh, so that you can reuse it over and over again and you don't waste um, a lot of plastic. Uh, water is also really important for children, so remember to always give your uh, child a bottle of water to keep with them um, at school, when they're going out. Um, so water is pretty essential, especially in the Middle East where it gets really hot and um, we need to keep hydrated all the time. Some people ask how much water should I drink throughout the day. Uh, they used to say eight bottles, but most people need a lot more than that. So just keep drinking water throughout the day, not just like one glass or two glasses and that's it. No, keep drinking water all the time. Um, and make sure you eat your vegetables, drink water and exercise often. Thank you.
Welcome back, dear viewers. And now uh, we go back to our guest, Dr. Dalal Al Haradi. And uh, now, um, you know, I have, you know, a big issue with surgeons. I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry, but I do. And uh, it's not because I don't like them, but their attitude <coughs> is usually really terrible. <laughs> um, how can you change my mind? Okay. Um, as as a patient, are you talking, or as a fellow no, colleague? No, no, I can't say both, both sides. Both. Yeah. Um, I think um, we are perceived as terrible, and but the truth You're is, you're bullies. We are. We could be. <laughs> we should be. I mean, our job is so stressful, and yeah. we deal really with 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 patients that I mean, we can't just give them medicine and just wait and see. We have to cut and see. We have to be brutal. We have to make decisions. And these decisions really, um, they're life changing. It could be the difference between life and death. And I, and I also, I do agree sometimes we're too, I mean, I think it's because we're blunt. I mean, we say it as it is. Uh, our culture. We don't sugarcoat. We don't it. sugarcoat. Exactly. Our culture. They love to be sugar. They love to be pampered, and they love the, the the information to be given to them over a period of a month. And breaking bad news, they want it to be taken over. Uh, probably, I don't know, one or two months. We don't have that. I mean, our our job is fast paced, and we we honestly don't have. I mean, we don't have time. Uh, to sit with a patient for like two or three hours like uh, and discuss it like physicians do or like intensivists do. We deal with a lot of patients, we deal with traumas, we deal with a lot of, I mean we deal with the family members and we have to be blunt, we have to tell them the truth. But there must be a way, like I know it's a, it's a huge thing but you know just you know, patients are as they are human beings, and they do need um, a lot of pampering. And as you said, our community is all about sugar coating. But um, you know, is there a way to solve this? For example, can there be a mediator between the doctor and the patient, just to sugar coat it just a tiny bit? That's do a bit think? difficult because I mean, what is the problem with us with the patients? especially when we're when we're taking consent i cannot have a person in between taking consent for a surgery that i'm planning to do on a patient i have to explain the risks i have to explain the complications to the patient myself and honestly there are no ways to sugarcoat for example death i can't there's no way that i can make it i i can tell it to him in a beautiful way <laughs> um, and you can't even smile about it of course and i can't it's, smile about it exactly that's especially serious. when it comes when it's when it's related to an elective surgery and uh, that's really the problem usually when taking consent that's when a lot of patients really whenever i tell them about any specific for example we're speaking about um sleeve which everyone is doing right now. Whenever um, they are, um, when they are consulted, or whenever they are, um, when whenever complications are discussed with the patients pre-op, a lot of them get angry or they get upset. Like I'm trying to scare them away. I'm not. These do happen. You have to understand them, and there is no other way around it. Yes, absolutely. Like you need to uh, be honest about what could happen because if you just tell a patient that no you should do it it's completely fine and you'll be grand they will have this misconception that they will wake up and they will feel like a hundred percent and it's never this case they will have of course some pain yes. and they will have certain side effects or certain things that they should feel and as you said a surgeon uh, or a good surgeon should be able just to communicate at least these things to the patient. I think this is very extremely important. Um, we noticed that here in Kuwait that, uh, as I said, they, they don't like, you know, the, the way the system goes in the hospitals and they prefer to go outside. Do you think Kuwait, we have enough you know, or good hus enough, you know, good enough hospitals just to acquire the people's needs. We do, and uh, and that's why we see whenever any a lot of private hospitals, whenever they deal with a comp or they refuse to deal with complications, and whenever they actually are in a situation in which the patient gets complicated, uh, they get referred back to the 
our hospitals or the government hospitals, we do have the, facil the facilities about it. We do have excellent staff. Uh, but the problem is that it's a little bit, there's, there's a bureaucracy everywhere. And that's why it, their, their work or might be delayed a little bit, but it's within normal limits. I mean, we're not delaying them. And you know, if they come to me, for example, in an out outpatient, they get an appointment within a week or two. They, they're not, they don't, uh, before, previously, appointments might begin after three or four months. So there is improvement. We just need a little bit of time for those improvements to actually show. But there is absolutely, absolutely agree. Um, now, being a female in the field of surgery must have been very hard, I must say, and uh, it's a challenge, I think. But um, do you think it was challenging for you to just be a surgeon? It was. Um, it was a big decision. Um, however, I might say that I got a lot of support from both female surgeons who were um, senior to me and actually from my from my team I mean I I can't thank my unit unit A and Amira Hospital I seriously cannot thank them enough for <laughs> I was really there I was their child and uh, honestly during the board itself I was never discriminated against as a female um, Professor Adel I mean nobody can have a better uh, director uh, than us in general surgery and also recently we have Dr. Abtissam al Badr and she's been like an amazing um, contributor to our board and and she's been really amazing to us uh, residents so um, during the board I can proudly say we were treated equally I was picked as chief resident at the end and also valedictorian for the graduation so I guess I was treated okay as a female surgeon. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank and you. it's such an amazing inspiration to all of those doctors who are wishing to be um, surgeons in the future. And um, now, um, you know, just being a female surgeon, of course, as you said, it was a challenge, but you got a lot of support, which is really, really nice. And uh, do you think that you, um, you're, of course, you want to be a breast surgeon, and do you think that you want to continue with here in Kuwait or you want to go abroad? Unfortunately, we, we don't have fellowship programs here in Kuwait, so the plan is to try and apply for yeah. abroad. Um, specifically trying to apply for UK and trying to apply for um, North America or Canada and uh, I'm hoping crossing <laughs> my fingers I'm hoping for that really yeah why not it's really amazing Thank and uh, I'm sure like you have a lot of uh, female role models in your life but can you tell us about the you know the one female surgeon that inspires you all the time female surgeon that inspired me a lot I might say Dr. Abdeslam al Uh She's also a breast surgeon. She works at Mubarak Hospital. Her dedication to her work, her dedication to her students, and her dedication to um, us residents was, I mean, it's, it's an inspiration for me. I did not work personally with her. However, um, I, um, I have seen her work at uh, Mubarak Hospital, yeah. and she does inspire us. So what are the things in your personality that you think that makes you an amazing surgeon? Um, I'm blunt. I say it <laughs> as it is. <laughs> That's <good>. one, definitely <laughs> one thing. Yeah. I'm aggressive. I'm very aggressive, especially okay. when it comes to, um, especially when it comes to my patients. Yeah. And I am highly protective of my team. If anybody comes near anybody from my team, I would like, I turn into a cat and like <laughs> I protect okay, them. Okay, really. you sound dangerous <laughs> to me. <laughs> I'm a surgeon. What can I you say? You have really? to be aggressive. I, that's, I, that's, I am that's aggressive. What, yes. You know the job needs. <laughs> yes, and, I'm uh, aggressive unfortunately. You know, that's that's really good. No, I'm 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 uh, You're very timid. <laughs> I am I'm I'm uh, you know a, a good family physician because I'm you know smiley and uh, you listen, I'm friendly. You're very I like patient. to listen and patient yeah. and I think, yeah, this is the problem of Aquarius. Aquarius <laughs> people, I think they're always like this. Surgery did change me, honestly. I was not like that when I first started my internship. I yeah. really was quiet. I was really, I mean, I was as meek as a mouse, but um, yeah. I mean, after like six years of surgery, I'm like completely transformed into another person. <laughs> I had to. Yeah, but I mean it, of course you need to be, this is like part of growing up in the field and uh, it yeah. will add and it will change you <laughs> and I'm, it's, it's really good.
I'm uh, sure. Now, um, you know, the, um, of course, you're in our show and you're going to be the host. Yeah. And, of course, you're going to be an amazing addition to our show. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure you have a, l a ton of ideas. Oh, my God. You have to tell us about this. What do you have plans for this show? Um... Um, I want it to be a little more interactive. I mean, I want more interaction. I want more props. Um, um, I don't want the show just to be based on a studio setting. I'd love it to we'd like go out and meet um, and meet the doctors or meet the physicians or any medical field, anyone in the medical field outside at their work. And uh, I'd also love to have once in a while we'd actually have um, an audience. We'd have it alive in an audience, just like other shows outside. Wow, I think it's a great idea. Why not? We That's what I would, have, um, yeah, I'd love. That I like interaction with uh, with the audience. I'd like to also have segments added on the show, uh, specifically different aspects in the medical field, and uh, that's what I'm thinking of, honestly. Um, now, if uh, there is a question from one of our viewers, and she's asking. Um, uh, about, um, you know, because you're interested, of course, in breast surgery. So she's asking, is there any dangers in uh, having uh, breast surgery? Are there any complications to breast surgery? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, breast surgery is a huge topic. It depends on what breast surgery that she actually had. I mean, if she's having implants, um, this is something completely different. I mean, the implant itself might have some problems. And a lot of people are asking, um, would implants cause uh, breast cancer in the future? Which it doesn't. It might change the way that we have to screen and investigate for cancer, but it's, it's, it's not. I mean, any, bre any surgery can have its own complications. They mm -hmm. can have infection, they can have bleeding or hematoma, breast included. When we have a mastectomy done, uh, specific uh, complications of mastectomy include injuring the nerve, which uh, they will have a winged scapula. Another thing is injury to the vessels that supply the axilla, so they might end up with a swollen arm and they might end up with, um, um, with the lymphedema of, yeah. the, of the arm, whether it's right or left. But really, um, the beauty of breast surgery, it's mostly it's a clean surgery. Okay. I mean, it's always it's all outside, so the complications they're there, but they're much less than when you're doing any other surgery, especially inside the abdomen. Okay. Uh, so, what about um, uh, hemorrhoids? Uh, of course, uh, our viewer Abdul Wahab is asking, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, should uh, hemorrhoids be operated on? Um, first, we have to fi we have to see the degree of uh, the the hemorrhoids that the patient has it has to be um, we have to see it um, through a proctoscopy through the yes. of course in the outpatient uh, clinic. Uh, then we grade the piles and uh, we try usually the first and the second grades where they're only having um, painless bleeding or when they're only having mild prolapse of the of the piles that yes. reduced by itself. Mm -hmm. Usually this goes with um, medical treatment or conservative treatment. Avoiding constipation is uh, it's paramount for piles. You cannot treat piles without treating the complications. A third and fourth degree that are usually more advanced in which there's really prolapse and it's hard to reduce. Um, these often fail conservative therapy and usually these um, usually need surgery. However, I notice a lot of people coming to the OPD saying, I have piles, I have piles. 90% of those have actually anal fissure. They have yeah. pain and not actual piles. Yeah. So um, the first thing is get a proper diagnosis. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and you don't, don't get you know, the medicine from your GP without any examination. You have to be and really fully And some go to the examined. pharmacy and they say, I have yeah, piles without, you know, being, investigated. without being investigated. They're saying that we are failing, investi we are failing treatment when in yeah. fact they are taking treatment for something completely different than what absolutely. they have. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Now, um, the other question in which our viewer asked is, um, is there any chance of recurrence of hemorrhoids after the surgery or not? Yes, that's why we said comp uh, constipation, uh, if they're having problems with their bowel motion, it has to be treated because if they continue to have constipation, um, in the future they might develop um, Piles again. Piles is basically a cushion of blood vessels that's engorged. So when we are removing them, you're not removing the blood supply, basically. So um, if you continue to have constipation post-surgery, after a few years, yes, there is a possibility that you might develop piles again. Okay, so since we're on the topic of hemorrhoids, um, what are the real causes of hemorrhoids? Is there any specific things that you can think of? 
Um, mostly over here, it's um, females. We see a lot of them are post, um, post uh, with, with pregnancy. They have a lot of pressure. And of course, with, uh, with post delivery, where they're actually con with their contractions, they would develop piles. Uh, constipation over here in Kuwait is the most common uh, cause. As with they're, they're really severely constipated, especially with the food yeah. that everyone is consuming, with the fast foods. Yeah. Uh, an alarming patient with is, is if somebody is presenting with bleeding PR, usually they present with painless bleeding. If a, somebody is in an old age, for example, a male more than 50 or more than 60, then I'd have to think of doing an actual colonoscopy and see that there's nothing underlying that we might have missed, that it's not the piles, that's actually something else. So would you advise people with piles? Uh, avoid constipation. Okay. Avoid straining. That's very important that for that they would avoid uh, straining. Okay, They're so about thing. the constipation, um, are there specific things that you would recommend to the patients just to do High to fiber. avoid it? High fiber is, is they hate it's it. key. <laughs> key. And a lot of them, they are afraid of taking um, um, laxatives and they're afraid of taking um, Normacol or they're afraid of taking um, high fibers. Okay. Uh, they think that they would get dependent on them, um, which is not true. They would okay. not get dependent on Normacol or on, uh, or on laxatives or lactulose. So to continue using the, uh, the laxatives and of course to avoid straining. Of course, um, the addition of what you just said is um, having a healthy diet and, you know, just uh, being active as well uh, it does help uh, does. the constipation Drink a lots lot. of water and anything green. I always tell my patient, whenever you see something green, eat it. Absolutely. Green is good. <laughs> green is good. And uh, eating a lot of uh, oats is actually really good for constipation. Uh, I mean, for me, I always tell my patients just eat a lot of oats because it's it's an amazing thing and as, as well um, because since I was working in Ireland I remember when I was in the geriatric ward what they give the patient is prune juice and um, they do give it to all the patients there just that to prevent help. them from having uh, and that would it's, help. it's really nice uh, and it does help a lot and I think it's available on a, in, in a lot of stores or yeah. you just can eat the prune by itself and it True. will help uh, oats is also a great idea, but I also have to tell my patient that they will get a lot of bloating <laughs> from oats. <laughs> if, yeah, if you have yeah, other problems as well. Did you know that oats, um, I've read um, in the inter of the internet that oats was the most, uh, oats was the prophet's favorite meal. Yeah. That they eat it all the time. So, yeah. but like I said, it would cost bloating. So it beware of that. Bloating, but I mean, yes. I don't but know it's why amazing. people I love are porridge. afraid of bloating. I, I love mean, porridge. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, <laughs> you I like it? I love like porridge. What's your favorite porridge recipe? I'm um, sure you have one. Oats. I'd add chia seeds, which are extremely important. Uh, which I think it's really important to add in our diet. And I'd also add uh, maple syrup to sweeten it up. Okay. And uh, top it off with bananas and trail mix. Um, it's lovely. It's lovely. <laughs> uh, yummy, yummy. You have to do it uh, sometime on our show. It will be really great. Inshallah. We have a question from one of the viewers and he's asking um, if in case an accident happens and one of the fingers or, um, you know, have been lost during the accident, what should they do immediately? Um, immediately just cover it in ice, bring it with ice. Unfortunately, we don't have, um, or ge as general surgeons, we don't have experience <coughs> with lost digits. This goes for um, both, um, I think, orthopedics, hand surgeons. They're usually the ones who deal with it. But I think it's most important that uh, we keep it viable and we avoid the finger of really dying. So when putting it in ice, you are completely stopping um, whatever um, activity that's happening. There. And so should they keep the amputated finger in the ice? Or they did keep it in the bag and bag, bring it. bag inside uh, filled with an. It's like the organ bag. It's like the organ box. It's okay. filled with ice or the Pepsi <laughs> or the or the Just Pepsi keep the finger in the ice and keep it there. And in the bag, uh, of you'll put it back on. Hopefully, an orthopedic <laughs> per, an orthopedic surgeon would. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. And um, now we're almost uh, reaching our end of the show, of course. So can you just give us? five tips for the audience um, that you can think of out of your head all right for my female surgeons when it, uh, for my female sorry patients whenever you have a lump 
please come and visit a surgeon, please come and visit us. And uh, since we talked about um, piles, then I'd like to say, uh, please drink lots of water and please uh, eat whatever green you see in front of you. Okay, that's three. <laughs> Sorry, it's all food related and nutrition related. <laughs> you probably are, uh, are hungry, huh? <laughs> no. Yeah. I can't think of really anything else. Be safe. Oh, as a surgeon, please drive slowly. I mean, the amount of traumas that we're getting from, from car accidents, it's becoming crazy. It's increasing. And so please drive safe and please wear a seatbelt. Uh, the weather is lovely. I think I'm increasing now more than five. The weather is lovely. So if you're on a motorbike, please wear a helmet and uh, please wear your protective gear, really. That's really good advice, doctor, mm -hmm. and I hope everybody listens. Please do <laughs> that, and uh, I hope uh, we do a special episode just about the safety in the road. And thank you so much, doctor, thank for being you for here. Having me. And I wish you all the best uh, here in our show and in life in general. And um, really, you're such a sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here, and uh, I'm looking forward to this adventure. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, thank you, dear viewers, for watching us uh, tonight. And uh, this is the end of our show. Don't forget to watch us next, next week for another episode of Healthy Life. Stay healthy. Good night. <laughs>